to welcome every single location around the world. It's great to be joining you for part two of Smash the Idols. And if you're thinking, man, that's a bit of a controversial topic title, that could get you in trouble. Yes, it could. And we're up for it. Because there's something about our lives. There are so many things for Christians, even if we're atheists or agnostics here today. This series is all about the things that we put first in our life that fundamentally get in the way of our relationship with God, but actually also get in the way of our relationship with others and actually can tear us apart from the inside out. And the reality is, is that mankind is consumed with things that it loves, it worships, it fears that robs us of our relationship with God, but even impacts our relationship with one another and turns us inside out. And so this whole series, when we're talking about smashing idols, you know, idols, they don't just go easily. They don't just go nicely. You got to smash them. You got to get the sledgehammer out. You got to get the axe out. You got to get the sword out. And so I've just been saying to Hereford Campus, this series demands response. It demands change. I'm even going to go as far as say, some of us is going to demand some radical response. Oh, that's so radical. We don't like that word. We don't like the word radical. Yeah, because it's been twisted for the, and used for the wrong thing. But when people live radical lives for Jesus, it changes the world for the better, for the good. I believe this series, some of us are going to look at our jobs, our careers, our homes, our possessions, ourselves. I believe some of us, that God's going to demand us to let go of some things. And even right now you're going, ooh. That's what following Jesus means. A life of surrender. A life of letting go so that we can take hold of it. But so often when we think about idols, we think that it's just a cultural issue or a historical problem. You know, we think of Eastern mysticism and so often when we think of idols, we think of scenes like this. People literally going and worshipping man-made, you know, statues and pictures. And here's the thing, Christians do this. The church is full of Christian statues of saints that if we go and light a candle, we'll be blessed. It's tosh. That's idol worship just as much as anything else. People go and worship statues of Mary. That's not biblical. Sorry if I'm bursting your bubble here and we're going deep straight away. You know, don't just think about it as Eastern mysticism, but you know, it's not what Jesus died for. It's not what he rose again for. But the thing is, if you go out into any of our major cities and you go to a shopping mall on Saturday, you'll see the same scene. People living their lives for things other than God, other than others. Going to the shrine of their favourite brand. Going to the shrine of their favourite shop. That through purchasing something, they have identity. They have purpose. You've got to realise whether it's Eastern mysticism or Western consumerism. You see, the problem isn't that it's cultural, historical. It's human. You can go all the way back, all the way back to any time that you would deem a human existence and you will see humans idolizing something, whether it was the sun, whether it was the world around them, whether it was themselves. We have this human issue. Our hearts, John Calvin said, our hearts are a factory for idols. And here's the thing, that factory never shuts down. We'll just keep churning out one. Here's the thing. You can make an idol within church. When people start saying, my ministry. No one has a ministry of their own that, was, that they can say, mine. It's God's ministry that, they let, that he let me be a part of. My ministry. We can make an idol out of how we pray. I'm pretty good. I love the people that preach pray. They're not actually praying. They're saying a preach. And it's not for the ears of God, it's for the ears of people around them. We can make an idol out of it because it's it's not a cultural thing, it's not a historic thing, it's a human thing. And the problem is, right, when it comes to idolatry, when it comes to the things that we're going to place above God, the danger isn't necessarily in the item itself. I'm not saying that when you went this weekend and bought a new jacket, that that jacket's evil. Right? Right? The problem isn't in the danger of the item. The problem is in us. 
The problem is the human heart. I believe there are people across our locations that God's going to challenge you around the home you own, the car you drive, the career you have, the amount of money you're relying on in your bank account, like it's God. And there's gonna, He's going to challenge you to make some changes. The problem isn't necessarily in the item. The problem's in us. The problem's in us. The problem's in us. So you might be asking yourself, okay, right. If we all idolize things, if we can all put things above God in our lives, then how do I find out what might be an idol to me? And this is a great sentence that you can write down and start to break down and start to examine for yourself. Idols disproportionately consume our thoughts, our actions, or our resources. Now let's break this down. Idols disproportionately. You know, I just mentioned the idea of God challenge us in maybe around the home we own, right? The home itself isn't necessarily an evil thing or an idol, but when it disproportionately consumes, disproportionately consumes, here's a good one, people's opinions. Often disproportionately consume our thoughts, our actions, or our resources, then probably it becomes an idol. I know people who are disproportionately consumed by the cleanliness of their car more than they are the health of their marriage. I know people who are disproportionately consumed with the perfection of their garden over their grandkids. You see, when it becomes something that disproportionately consumes your thoughts, your actions, your resources, chances are it's an idol. Or as Soph said, disproportionately consuming our, our thoughts, our actions, our resources, or taking our eyes off God. You see, I believe that we, we actually have mainly sort of two groups of idols, external things and internal things. External things that we chase after, we run after. Internal things that we chase after, we run after. We want to feel certain things. We want to think certain things. We want to have a certain reputation. We want to own the external, a certain type of house, or have a certain element of our career or success. We have external and internal. I believe that often the external idols we have are to do with control. Something that gives us a level of security. Often the internal idols we have are rooted in insecurities. We want to feel valued. Why? Because we don't value ourselves. Often those external things that are from control are about protection, which is rooted in fear. People holding on, building their retirement plan, not because a retirement plan is evil or bad, but because it's rooted in a fear and they find protection in money. People running after another boyfriend, another girlfriend for more affirmation because they have this desire rooted in insecurity. And what we see is that often the external idols cross over with our internal idols and our internal idols will often outwork themselves in our external life. So as you're starting to think about this, you've got to start to understand and think, what, what, is, what are my thoughts consumed by? What are my actions consumed by? What do I spend my money on? You want to know what your idol is? Look at your bank account. You want to know, what, you know maybe what some of your idols are? And you might be surprised at what you find. You see, these external and internal things that drive us and ultimately come before God in our lives. If you think about it, around the world, in every culture, most people turn to an idol for protection or prosperity. You know, when I've been in in the Far East and I've talked to people about why they go to temples and and take food to the shrines outside the house, it's not, it's rarely because they love that God. It's because they're trying to ward off evil spirits. So it's actually about fear. Or, well, if I sacrifice this, then my business will succeed. What is that? It's prosperity. Both rooted in self. And today, what we're going to talk about, the fact that idols aren't about idols, they're about us. So this whole thing of idols, it runs all the way through the Bible. Uh, It's not an Old Testament thing, it's a Bible thing. 
right? And the more you read about it in the New Testament, you'll see that God refers to it time and time again. But one of the most famous parts where we first sort of really understand God's view about idols is in the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible. And this chapter, chapter 20, is probably the most famous chapter of Scripture ever. It's the Ten Commandments, something that even atheists know about, right? And so the Ten Commandments, if you're not familiar with Bible history, what's happened up until this point is the people of Israel, they've been set free out of slavery. They've seen God do incredible things. They've walked through a parted sea. They've seen 10 plagues. They've been set free. They've been led by a pillar of fire and smoke. It's incredible. But God comes to their leader, Moses, and says, Moses, for your own good, I need to give you some rules and some laws to live by. So many people have misunderstood the Ten Commandments thinking that they were about God. They weren't. They were about us. And this was the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. And in our vain world, we think God's a bit needy. He wants to be number one. I mean, come on. I thought he was humble. This commandment isn't about what God needs. It's about what we need. You see, When you have a God in your life, an idol, something that you love, that you worship, that you fear, that you give your life to, that isn't Him first, your world will fall apart at some point. It doesn't matter which way you spin it, in this life or the next. He says, you will have no other gods before me. It's not that God's needy, it's that we are. But the second commandment, right, this is the first time that God's ever written anything down, like on stone for mankind. And the second thing, this is how much of a priority it is for God. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, the earth below, or the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. He's basically saying, do not make for yourself. Who's the idol about? Us. Making for yourself. But the thing is, it wasn't actually about, oh, you can't have a picture of an angel or a statue of something like this. Because if it was that, then Moses breaks this commandment in just a couple of chapters time where he commissions the making of some cherubim to sit on top of the Ark of Covenant. It wasn't actually about the item. It was about the fact that they then worshipped them. You see, so the problem isn't having a great career. It's when you worship it. The problem isn't when you have a nice nice car, it's when you worship it. The problem isn't having a fantastic relationship, it's when you worship it. And it's all about worship. You see, it's about what we worship and what we chase after. And that's why this is so key in our lives, because we don't realise it, but most of us aren't worshipping God first. Because think about this, what consumes your thoughts? It's not often God. What disproportionately takes your resources. It's rarely God. What disproportionately consumes your actions? It's something else other than God. So probably, therefore, we're worshipping something else other than God with our lives. And whatever that is, it's an idol. Are you with me? Are you you following? If you want to know what, you know, I'm going to break worship down. Worship is ultimately where you give your affection and effort, and where you get your affirmation and recognition. So you want to know what idols are in your life? Start asking, where am I giving my affection and my effort? Is it to God or is it to myself? Is it to God and to others or is it to my own career and my own success? Where do I get my affirmation and my recognition? You see, from Exodus 20, over the course of the next 10 to 12 chapters, um, Moses comes down the mountain. He says, guys, got these 10 rules. We've got to live by them. And if we live by them, we're going to thrive. The Israelites on multiple occasions say, we will do everything that the Lord has commanded. Over the course of like those 10 or 11 chapters, they say it three times. You know, they've seen God set them free. But then by Exodus 32, this happens. Now, when the people saw that Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together. In a few verses time, what we're going to see is the people made 
a golden calf. They made an idol, right? And so just a few days, a few weeks after they walked through the Red Sea, they walked through it, right? They start to turn back to their idols. I want to make this point. We will often turn to our idols when we think God's late. Delayed in coming down the mountain. When we're waiting for God, that's when we turn to our idols. When he's promised us provision, but it's not coming the time frame we thought, we go back to our idols. Think about King Saul. Right? King Saul is a very famous character in the Bible. And he was told by a prophet, a guy called Samuel, wait here for me to anoint you. Wait here. Samuel was delayed. So Saul just took the bucket of oil and anointed himself. He made an idol of himself and he lost his anointing. So often we turn back to our idols just a few weeks after God's moved. It never ceases to amaze me seeing people have these amazing, even for my own self, having these incredible encounters with God where he sets them free only to see a few weeks later, they're off building another golden calf. Because the problem isn't cultural. The problem isn't historical. The problem isn't in the item itself. The problem's in us. And we've got to realise the condition of our human heart because if we don't really realise that, we're never really going to deal with our idols. It goes on and it says this, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So often when we're waiting, we doubt the God-given leadership in our life. When we're in that place of tension, Yeah, well, I thought Moses was a good guy, but he's been up that mountain a little bit longer. And so they then make this this idol, right? But read that again. Let um, come, make us gods that shall go before us. The idol wasn't about having an idol. It was about them. You see, we've got to realise that one of the ugliest, most significant idols in our world is the idol of self. In fact, I would actually go as far as to say that this is almost like the bedrock idol where we want to be the centre of our world, of our worship, of our universe. Do you know what you worship more than God? Yourself. (laughs) Yeah, maybe your money's in that, your career, but all those things point to whose glory? Yours. Nine times out of ten, the person you're worshipping in God's place is you. This is what the golden calf should have looked like. Because so often that's the case. We look at them and we go, oh, that is ridiculous. Those Israelites making a golden calf. Just go back over your diary this last week and see where you were making your own. We make idols out of ourselves. Just a slight funny aside. I went into the media office and I said, guys, I know it's going to sound a bit funny, but I need a picture of my face on a golden calf. And they were like, okay. So I was making this face with with one of the guys and then Liv, who was one of our worship leaders, and we show it to Liv and she went, oh, you meant a golden cow. And I went, yeah. What did you mean? Oh, golden calf muscle. (laughs) So, (laughs) I asked her permission to share that. I just thought it was too good. It was too good. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. (laughs) Idols, right? Idols. Let's go back. Let's go back so you're not too distracted. Okay, you wanted to take a picture. There you go. But back in on me once you've taken your pictures. Right. Listen. Idols will rob you of your relationship with God, but also your relationship with others and your own health. Your own health. The wave of depression and mental illness, doctors are saying, is linked to how we view ourselves, which is linked to self-esteem, which is linked to the idols we have in our heart. This is huge. Some of the epidemics we have of obesity are about the idol of self. It's not about greed or gluttony. It's about me. I deserve, I want, I need, me, me, me. 
Just think about for a second. I'm going to take that off the screen because it's distracting. (laughs) Just think about this for a second. In Genesis chapter 3 was the fall of mankind. The enemy came as a serpent and said to Adam and Eve, if you eat that apple, you'll be like God. What did he provoke? The idol of self. I could be like God. Why did she eat the apple? Her own desire to make herself great. You've got to realise that this idol of self, it runs through so much. And the problem is, is it doesn't just rob our faith, it robs marriages. I know, I know story after story of people who were running after their careers in their marriages because it was an idol and they weren't willing to deal with that. And then their marriage is apart, falls apart. I'm not saying that with judgment. I'm saying because it's a reality. Because here's the thing, you've got to realise how ugly idols are. Because we've got them in our lives. And we're like, oh yeah. And we think that it's going to all be okay. This series needs to be a wake up call. If you can walk out of hearing this message and not do anything, God, you you got to, that, that needs to scare you. If you're a believer. It needs to scare you because what's it say about your walk with God? You know, I believe, let's get back through this. I believe that the current generation is probably the most self-centered, self-focused, selfish generation, maybe in history. Just think about the selfie. This is apparently classed as the original selfie back from the late 1800s. And I love a selfie. I'll take it a, a selfie with my friends. You know, Mona Lisa's getting in on it as well. The thing I find amazing about selfies is grown men pouting. (laughs) On on what planet? But the thing is, it's not just the young'uns, even old farmers are getting in on it as well. But the thing is, right, when we think about the selfie, a selfie in and of itself is not bad. But do you know that one in three photos taken now is a selfie? Do you know that a hundred million selfies are taken a day? What I find funny when I follow people, even I know I've done it myself on social media, where they've gone on holiday, maybe to an amazing landmark, and they take a picture of themselves with the landmark. They're not taking a picture of the landmark. They're taking a picture of themselves. I'm here by the Eiffel Tower, and you're like, the Eiffel Tower? Where's the Eiffel Tower? Oh, it's the little like knobble coming out of their head. Oh, what a great sunset. Well, I can't see it. All I can see is your schnoz. We are so consumed with self. I go as far as to say that never before in human history has mankind had the capacity to make idols of itself quite like now. Why? Because we are one of the most advanced eras in human history and one of the most prosperous ones. And those two things give us the capacity to make idols of ourselves. This chap is Henry VIII. Class as one of the most conceited, narcissistic individuals in history. He was desperate to have a son, not because he wanted to play football or rugby on a Sunday afternoon, but because he wanted to keep his line going. Just a side point. Those of us who are pushing the family business on our son, who are we doing that for? Them or us? Those of us pushing our career choices on our children, who are we doing that for? But how do we know that Henry VIII was so self-centered and so self-absorbed? It's because there are hundreds of paintings of him. He commissioned selfies all the time. But the reality is now you don't need a painter, you just need a smartphone. And I would say that actually technology has given us the outlet to be the self-centered people we've always been. Now, before you get on your high horse and talk about how great technology is to help people, yeah, I know that, but let's call a spade a spade. Social media brings out the worst in us. It does. Keyboard warriors tearing people down who would never say it to their face. What's that say about humanity? Vanity, depression, issues with body image, never higher, never bigger in all of history. Why? Because we're making idols of ourselves. Instagram has taught us how to make brands of ourselves. We don't want to share our photos. We want to be followed as a brand. You know, when, we, when I do the same, I put up a photo and in the sort of the first 10 minutes after putting it up, I go and check if it's been liked. 
Check if it's been commented. Because my priority is not sharing a photo. My priority is being followed. Because actually it's an idol of self. It's who I am. Kim Kardashian, one of the most followed people on Instagram. If you don't know who she is, she's a reality TV star. In her own self says, I have no particular real talent. And then when asked, well, why do people like following you? She said, because I love talking about myself. We idolize the self-idol. Because here's the thing, we'd really like to be her. We'd really like to get to talk about ourselves all day. And some of us are like, no, I wouldn't yet. There's no one exempt. It's part of the human condition. It's part of the human condition. Our statement with our career, our lifestyle. You know, I said it wasn't just an Old Testament thing. Check this out. In Philippians 3, this is Paul writing. And this is where hopefully the screw gets turned on this idol of self and how deep and destructive it is. It says this, for as I have often told you, right? Paul is basically saying, if Paul says, I've often told you, he's saying, I need to tell you again. It's on repeat. It's on repeat. As I've often told you, and now I tell you again, even with tears, it breaks my heart. You know, me sharing this, I'm not exempt from what I'm sharing. It breaks my heart that this is the state of our society. It breaks my heart that this is the state of me. I tell you, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Guys, this is what I'm talking about. When you live for yourself, your destiny is destruction. Those who want to keep their life will lose it. Those who give their life away will find it. You got to realize this isn't just about, oh yeah, maybe I need to be a little less self-centered. Maybe I need to be a little less selfish. Now you've got to realize that when you live for yourself, you're living at odds with God. I hope this weight is starting to land on you. But it says this, their God is their stomach. In a, in a verse we're going to look at in a moment, it says their vanity, their worldly desires. You know, I don't know who this chap is. And fair dues to him, he clearly was a chubster and he's worked hard and now he's a bit of a beast. And ladies, if I make any of you stumble, please forgive me. I just needed to use this as an example, right? But when we talk about our gods of our stomach, I think these two pictures sum it up really well. Because the gods of our stomach is just as much in indulgence as it is in perfection. You see, when we go after that next you know, beer or that next chocolate, or the, which in itself is not an idol, a problem in the item, it's a problem in us. We feed that idol of self. We worship ourselves. What part of the body does humankind obsess over more than any other part of the body? The abs. Because the God is their stomach. Hey, look, there's nothing wrong with being fit and healthy. The question is why? Are you doing it because of the external idol that you want that affirmation? You want to look better, bigger, harder, tougher than your friend? Or are you doing it because of the internal insecurity that somehow you're trying to cover over the fact that you don't like yourself? Both are idols. But if you live fit and healthy so that you can serve others, so you're going to live long and be around for your grandkids, so that actually you can go on a mission trip and not be exhausted after the first day, so that you can get up earlier to read your Bible, then you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for God. Some of us aren't very convinced about that. I think it's because this is challenging. I think this is because for all of us, me included, we're going, flip! I'm so self-focused. I remember talking with a friend of mine from university and I, I saw him at a, uh, a wedding. We hadn't seen each other for years. And he, uh, he was a real inspiration to me at university. He was a, a great sort of Christian mentor. And, he, um, and we were talking at this wedding. He said, man, Dave, you've changed. I was like, yeah, God's really transformed me. And he honestly said at three, half past three in the morning, um, in the, the, the pub that we were staying in, because it was real late when we have this conversation, he says, man, I feel like I've lost my fire. And I said, why have you lost your fire? And he said, I guess I've just gotten consumed in my job. He was on a six-figure, and not a small bottom-level six-figure sum. He was on a huge 
huge sum of money. And then he went to then say, hey, yeah, but you know, I'm doing it for the kids and you know, I'm getting their university fund and you know, I'm doing it for them. And I just looked him in the eye and I said, no, you're not. He said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not doing it for the kids. That's just a healthy byproduct. I'm doing it for myself. Oh, I'm doing it to be able to give into the kingdom. No, you're not. You're doing it so you're the biggest giver in the kingdom. Idol of self. I'm doing this because I want to do all things as if I was doing it for the Lord. That's why I want this promotion. No, you don't. Because you care too much about it. You're doing it for yourself. It says, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality. We live in a world where God is not love. Love is God. And we're driven by our sensuality. Even in the church, we're compromising on biblical standards because of our sensuality. Self is the spirit of our age where it's all about us. It's all about me. And every other idol feeds it and lives off it. It's like the center of the bike wheel with every spoke coming off it. If you start to deal with the idol of self, you'll be able to tear down all the other ones because they won't have power. Guess this, whose glory is in their shame. Oh, when I read this, I, I remember thinking as a teenager, you know, I'd get around my mates having gone on a night out and we'd talk about how leathered we'd got and how much we'd vomited and how many girls we'd gotten with. We took glory in our shame as if that's glorious. And when we say it in the cold, hard light of day, sober on a Sunday morning, we go, oh my goodness. But Saturday night comes and we want another one. Why? Because we're feeding ourselves. Yeah. Idol of self. Because what am I doing? I drank. Yeah. I could drink. I pulled. I could pull. What's the idol? It's not alcoholism. Yeah. It's not lust. It's self. whose glory is their shame, who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things. But our citizenship, Paul says, is in heaven. Here's why I'm preaching this message. Because if there is one place that this should be a different way, it should be in the church. We should be living for God and living for others. And here's the thing, a lot of us aren't. At times, I'm not. And we need a change. We eagerly await a saviour from there. You know, um, before I was a pastor, I was a youth worker for a number of years. And I loved it and it was great. And towards the end of that part of my career, I worked for, and I did a lot of work in schools. And I worked for a great charity that actually came out of our, our church. It's, it, it's not anymore, but it was a great charity. And we impacted the city in a really amazing way. Um, but we were very focused on self-esteem. And over the last 20 years, 30 years, social reform, particularly here in the UK and in America, has been very focused on the issue of self-esteem. Why? Because we hate ourselves. And more than ever, you know, adverts, movies, TVs, it trains us to dislike the way we're made. Okay? And I read this in an article this week. It said that what we've realized, however, is that self-esteem isn't the cause, it's the result. And what we did in order to deal with people's self-esteem is we told the generation that's coming up underneath us, you're great, you're amazing, you're fantastic just the way you are. And there's truth in those things. But actually what we did in feeding ourselves that is we made us all narcissists. Self-absorbed, self... Do you know that 40% of millennials, that's my generation, think that they should be getting a promotion every two years regardless of performance? So nearly 50% of my generation think that we should be getting a promotion every two years, even whether, regardless of whether we've improved on our performance. How narcissistic is that? You're great. You're fine. It's actually created narcissism, which at its peak creates entitlement, which is where it becomes an issue in the church. This article was written by a non-Christian. They said this, we would have been better telling this generation that it was loved rather than it was great. Is that not the message of the gospel? Is that not the message? Even when you read the Bible and it feels condemning because God's highlighting our, our flaws and our failures and then yet he says, yet I love you. 
That'll cure every part of the idol of self when you know that you are loved, not for your performance, but for your position as a son or a daughter to God. And I ask the band to come up as we start to round up. But before we do, I want to say this. You have to smash this idol. You can't tickle it. You can't play with it. You can't have fun with it. Idols don't go easily. If you want to have a reality check, go and read the book of Judges. It's a long list of kings, most of whom had to deal with idols in their nation. Most of whom never really did. They got rid of some, but not rid of all. Go read it and see how God feels about it. But there's something about the fact that we can smash the idol of self. Why? Because we follow Jesus who smashed the idol of self. Jesus lived for something bigger than himself. If you go to Luke chapter four, you see Jesus going to the desert. He's fasting for 40 days and then he gets tested by the enemy. And what does the enemy test? He tests self. He says to Jesus, hey, if you're the son of God, you can turn this stone into bread. What's he doing? Testing his stomach, his appetite. Then he takes him up onto the top of a mountain and says, I can give you all these kingdoms. They'll give you glory. What's he do? Tests his pride. Then he takes him and says, hey, jump off here and God will catch you. He tests his focus and his trust and Jesus smashes that idol and says, I'm not going to live for myself. Look at the model of Christ. He constantly poured out every ounce of his fiber for us. That's the footsteps we walk in. That's the life we walk in. We can smash the idol of self because we're following in his footsteps. When you realize those things in your life, you can say, Jesus, help me be like you. I lay it down. How do I smash it? First things first, you've got to find out where you're living for yourself. You've got to check your motives. Why am I going for that promotion? A promotion isn't evil. Why am I trying to buy that next big house? A nice big house isn't evil. A nice new car, it's not evil. But the thing is, is why? What are your motives? Are you wanting to buy that house because you want to serve people who are hurting and broken and you want a bigger living room because you want to fit more people into it? Or do you want a bigger living room so that you can go to the coffee morning and talk about how great it is that you got this nice new house? Do you want that car so that you can load it up when somebody puts on the Facebook page saying, hey, we're moving and we don't have anybody to help us? Or do we just want to keep it for ourselves knowing that we've had an upgrade? You've got to check your motives. How do you do that? Ask yourself who benefits. Who really, really benefits? The next one, you've got to be ready to let go. In fact, I'd go further than that. You've got to make a practice of letting go. You've got to make a practice of letting go. Over the years, God has consistently started this journey with me where he said, Dave, I want you to give that away. I want you to give that away. What's it deal with? It doesn't deal with a fear of money. It deals with myself. And ultimately, you've got to give glory to God in every aspect of your life. If you get a promotion, give glory to God. If you buy a new house, give glory to God. If you get given a gift, give glory to God. And I'm not talking about that false humility glory. It was just God. I hate it when people say that. You know, I'll I'll encourage somebody who's been on stage and say, hey, you did a great job this morning. No, it was just God. No, you were there. It wasn't just God. He used you. We can make an idol out of humility. I am just so humble, but not really. I'm actually really profoundly proud because I'd like to be known as the humble one, that idol of self. Your flesh wants to rob you of your eternity. You see, when we worship God, and I mean live a life of worship to God, we are compelled to live for others. When we worship ourselves, the world is never enough. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have a big enough house. You'll never have enough of a success in your career. And either you'll make peace to it, with it and you'll live with regret for the rest of your life or you'll destroy everything that stands in your path of your own success.
The biggest thing we worship other than God is ourselves. The greatest idol, the ugliest idol is the me that cries out for more of me. So don't make yourself the object of your worship. We gotta resist. Spiritual warfare is a warfare of resistance. When that temptation comes in, don't condemn yourself for it, just resist it. When you realise that there's those parts of you that are so self-centred, so self-focused that you care more about success in your career than the health of your children, then you got to repent. Make God the object of your worship. Can I just ask, the guys backstage, can I have my phone back? Oh, there it is. As we close out, I'm going to hand over to all our locations in a moment. I want to read this. This is a prophetic word uh, that my friend Karen sent me a couple of weeks ago. And this is just a short excerpt from it. It said, this generation, particularly the younger, and here's the thing, that doesn't mean in age. It means in faith. And even for those of us who've been knowing and walking with Jesus for 30 years, you can take hold of this yourself. It needs to be taught the power of worship, the essential nature of worship, the fact that worship is our weapon to break through the things that would hold us. The enemy has come against this generation and placed other idols for them to worship. And now they need to know how worshiping God in spirit and truth is essential to their survival and their thriving. I'm not wanting to sound dramatic here, but if they're not worshiping God, then they will eventually worship other things. Music, movies, films that would be detrimental to them. The worship of the opposite sex, the worshiping of images online, pornography, money. We need to teach them to worship God.